Fox News podcast presents Brett Baer's All-Star Panel. America's got to be in the lead if you want to deal with these threats. We're going to lead. The morning is over. The shiva is done. And if you're a conservative, you should be optimistic. You know, my main priority right now is making sure that it delivers for the American people. We have to make our country great again, and I will do that. I think the president gets criticized by people all the time for the stuff he says, by people who ignore what he does. Now, Fox's chief political anchor, Brett Baer. Ohio Senator J.D. Vance and Minnesota Governor Tim Walz went head-to-head in the CBS vice presidential debate on Tuesday, introducing themselves to many Americans who didn't really know who they were or what they stood for. After the fiery presidential debate between Vice President Harris and former President Trump, the main takeaway for many Americans was the normalcy of this debate as the two vice presidential candidates prioritized policy and essentially mutual respect over personal attacks. Tim, first of all, I didn't know that your 17-year-old witnessed the shooting. And I'm sorry about that, and I, I hope appreciate you're okay. So. Christ have mercy. Meanwhile, things have taken a major turn overseas after Iran launched roughly 180 missiles toward Israel on Tuesday as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vows to retaliate against Iran. Fears of pivotal escalation in the region are emanating across the globe. To discuss this and more, we bring in our panel. Co-anchor of America's Newsroom, co-host of The Five, and host of the Perino on <laughs> Politics podcast. Are there any other things here? I have a dog named Percy. <laughs> <laughs> Dana Perino, Democratic strategist, fellow co-host of The Five, Jessica Tarloff, and Fox News senior congressional correspondent, Chad Pergram. Chad, you're the voice of God in this uh, <laughs> this operation. Um, oh. <laughs> first, first of all, what what is the sense up on Capitol Hill about... Uh, where things stand, especially when it comes to the Middle East. It seems like that's a a big focus. Yeah, one thing that I would watch for here is if there's some sort of escalation, something that goes beyond these attacks we saw the other day. I thought it was striking that Tom Cotton, the Republican senator from Arkansas, said on our air that he said, if I were the allies of Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas, and you fired a lot of stuff the other day, you fired some stuff back in April, and you really didn't have much to show for it, You know, what this has done is uh, demonstrated just uh, maybe, uh, you know, how fragile your military is. And you'd say these are the guys we're relying on. So I don't want to say that this is overstated, but that's one thing that they're picking up on. However, if there were to be a significant escalation, uh, you know, Jean Shaheen, the Democratic senator from New Hampshire, had indicated before they left Washington that she said we would be briefed remotely or something like that. Uh, You know, we've been talking a lot about disaster relief and if FEMA has the proper funds. Uh, They did not use Iron Dome, which is their defense shield in this round here. We have had occasions in the past where they've had to have the Congress, you know, give more money, give aid to uh, Israel here to reload that. Uh, That's not going to be the case now. But I could see a scenario where if this, uh, you know, keeps going down the road to get later in the year, uh, Israel might be back hat in hand asking the Congress for more aid. And guess who was just up here on Capitol Hill a couple of days ago? You had uh, Vladimir Zelensky, the leader of Ukraine. And that might be, you know, the trade-off. Say, okay, we're going to have some Ukraine aid here. We're going to have some Israel aid. And that's how they get the bill through. But right now, you know, people are very concerned if this were to spill out of control. And again, Congress is out of session, uh, but, uh, they, you know, they're not needed right now to come back. But there's a lot of concern about what this means for the election. Yeah, Israel aid, Ukraine aid, FEMA running out of money eventually uh, with all the natural disasters. Dana, the first questions were about the Iran attack on Israel from in the vice presidential debate. Um, what do you think, you know, a day later the fallout is from, from that debate? Well, one of the things that Chad was just talking about is whether this escalates in this different type of attacks. And we have seen in a couple of different world capitals that the Israeli embassy in those capitals have been attacked. And that could continue here in New York City. The New York uh, Police Department is increasing security at synagogues. And this is the uh, new year for the Jewish people. So I think there is reason to be have heightened alert. I also believe that the Israelis are doing something quite amazing for the rest of Western civilization. They're saying, okay, it's not good enough to be on defense and to have a September 10th mentality when it comes to fighting radical Islamic terrorism. And the enemies of the United States and other Western capitals are also the enemies of Israel. And actually, even um, Kamala Harris said that in her first statement after the attacks uh, when Israel pushed forward. So if you look back, there's several times over the past year, we're about on the year anniversary of the October 7th attacks, 
Several times since then, Joe Biden has said to Netanyahu, enough, you're good. Take the win. You're fine. Let's stop here. Be, this is good. We don't want to, we don't want to escalate anything. And that can, that's a fine position to have if you're in the United States and you're protected by oceans. But if you're Israel and you're being attacked by seven different fronts and you have the intelligence that was questioned after October 7th, because there was an intelligence failure there and we still don't know the whole story of that. But if you look at the remarkable uh, success of the pager rager, the walkie talkie attack, and then going after every single one of those Hezbollah guys, it's amazing. Uh, I was reminded of President Bush who had the deck of cards of all the Al Qaeda leaders. Mm -hmm. And then every time one of them was extinguished, they throw them in the drawer and like, who's next? Because you might, you can't fight your way out of an ideology, but you can incapacitate your enemy from attacking you. Mm -hmm. So to me, and perhaps Lloyd Austin is doing this. I know that our military is helping there, but they're, what they're saying is strange. Initially you had Biden and Lloyd Austin on uh, se separated. There was like big sunlight in between them. They came back together and then, but actually then Lloyd Austin's like, actually, maybe we're fine now. We don't need to do too much more. I don't know how many more weapons we need in the area. I asked Mike Gallagher that today, former congressman now with Palantir Technology. I'm like, do they have enough to defend themselves in Israel if this continues? And he's like, well, we'll see. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's like, that's not good enough. So I do think Western civilization owes Israel a debt of gratitude. Thanks. And they're going to need our help and support moving forward. Yeah, it was a little amazing to watch all the things that happened with the, the pager attack and, and to Dana's point, the targeted uh, strikes on these leaders. Some of those happened during Bibi Netanyahu's speech to the United Nations General mm -hmm. Assembly. I mean, it was like a scene from The Godfather, you know, like <laughs> totally. he's speaking and then they're all going out, maybe the violins playing in the background. Um, his poll numbers are changing, Netanyahu's. They, yeah. were, they were really down. They've taken, a, uh, as you can imagine, a step up. Do you think this relationship between this administration changes because of the situation? I just want to godfather it for a second. You just swap in an Italian restaurant for Barney Greengrass. Mm -hmm. He was up there <laughs> having a bagel with locks. And right. there was a tweet that I legit L L LOL'd at, but about laying out the scene of Bibi Netanyahu being here in New York, having his bagel, then going to get a black and white cookie and Nasrallah mm -hmm. blowing up mm -hmm. while he's standing on the Upper East Side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And apparently that was part of the intelligence failure on Hezbollah's side in thinking that Bibi wouldn't do something like this he when he was out of the country, yeah. that he would have to be home for that. And it has completely changed the calculus, yep. um, how many steps ahead of them they have been. Um, the poll numbers, I've seen it go up. And I think, and Dana can speak to this as well, having worked for Bush, this feels like the first time that Bibi is now a wartime president since October 7th. They have mm. been at war, mm. but something has changed. And I think it, a lot of that has mm. to do with the international community rallying around him in more of a complete way. Everyone was supportive of Israel after 10-7. But now that this fight has most people, mm -hmm. I, I understand mm -hmm. why you're shaking your head. Yeah, no, but I'm, I'm thinking that's, I think you're making a very good point because in some ways he needed he needed to have a win. and. It's not just that the world would rally around you, but it's that your enemy will fear you if you show strength. And if you're, what did Osama bin Laden say? He's like, remember, he wasn't worried about the United States because he thought we would never fight back. Mm -hmm. And then when Israel could show, oh, no, not only do we have everyone's phone number, <laughs> we know exactly where you are and we and can And we're going to watch you. you get blown yeah, up. There's something about strength. But I think it's also that now, now that it is Iran, directly in this way that he he can make the argument to us mm. this is legitimately your enemy i understand like hamas and what they're doing on the west bank uh, in gaza like that doesn't matter to you as much as i'm telling you that there are western lives here are the names of the people mm. they have murdered they have been on your terror watch list and now we're doing the groundwork mm -hmm. and i think that's why you've seen stuff we were talking about it last night before the debate that these missiles are flying off of the uss cole like, we're in this. There are more troops that are going. I hope that this will not be a boots on the ground type of war, 
but we're in it in a way that we weren't before. And I think that's why you see Lloyd Austin and President Biden coming together. And when you talk about a ceasefire, I don't think that that means what it used to. I think that it used to mean stop it. Like, I want this to end. Who knows how many hostages are alive? I pray that as many, what it could be 130. I hope that they're all still alive. Odds are firmly against that based on what we know after the murder of those six hostages and getting into that round of tunnels. So I think that ceasefire now, it's an aside, it's the side dish of all of this. And the, the message is from the Western community, we see you, we see what you're doing, we see how careful you are being about this. There's no more negligence stories that are circulating. No one's even making up. Remember when they said that they blew up the hospital and it actually was a Hamas rocket that didn't, right, it was fell. a whimper. Yeah. You don't see that anymore, you know? Yeah, so, but Biden is still urging caution. He was asked today well, if Iran should go after the nuclear mm -hmm. sites or how would he feel if Iran went, I'm sorry, Israel went after Iran's nuclear sites and he said they shouldn't. <laughs> that seems pretty standard, like let's not have a nuclear war kind of stuff. I, I think that you really, that there must be a tacit understanding between BB and Biden that everyone has accepted they're going to do what they need to do for their country. And that if Biden stood up, and this is taking the election off the table, because I actually don't think that foreign policy will have a, a bigger effect, but I don't think that the same forces with the uncommitted movement and this anxiety about Palestinians, that doesn't exist in the same way. At least it doesn't on the left. It's not something that we hear about, that the campaign is concerned about in the same way. I think everyone is just kind of looking at each other with like a wink and a nod and just saying, you do what you got to do. The most powerful country in the world has to say, don't blow up nuclear sites. But I imagine if something mm -hmm. like that happened, that it wouldn't be, Bibi would not be castigated in the way hmm. that it, it would have been six months ago if something like that happened. There is, the, Chad, this uh, feeling that, that both sides are trying to de-escalate a little bit, um, uh, that, you know, Biden said what he said, and also former President Trump has said, you know, don't want World War III. Um, what's the feeling on the Hill? Yeah, and, and that's where I was struck. I'll come back to what Tom Cotton said. You know, he said, I don't think we're going to have World War III because of this, because he didn't think that Iran really flexed its muscles. Whereas you had Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, going on the air and saying, you know, if we elect Biden, or I'm sorry, Vice President Harris, uh, you're going to have World War III. That was said within a couple of hours of one another. But the thing that, that, that I find intriguing here is that you have this split inside the Democratic Party over Israel. Ayanna Presley, Democrat from Massachusetts, a member of the squad, uh, she blamed the escalations that we've had in the past few days. She blamed this on Netanyahu in particular. And something that was in the works even before this kind of kicked up the past few days is before they left for the recess, Bernie Sanders, the independent senator from Vermont, uh, indicated that he was going to force the Senate to have a vote sometime in November when they return on a resolution of disapproval about selling arms to Israel. That is going to split the Democratic caucus. Uh, we asked Chris Van Hollen, the Democratic senator from Maryland, who represents a lot of Jewish uh, voters in the Maryland suburbs, but also a lot of very liberal voters in other parts of the state uh, who don't see this in quite the same prism. And he was kind of torn about this. He really didn't give a direct answer as to how he might vote on that. And so that is the schism inside the Democratic Party and the real politic here on Capitol Hill. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. All right, so back to the debate. Um, listen, we've talked about how vice presidential debates really don't don't affect much. Um, this was a bit of a coming out party for both guys. Yeah, and I think that if your goal was do no harm, uh, J.D. Vance certainly did no harm for Trump and did some good, I think, for him, especially because Trump's been out there talking for eight years and people have very strong views on him. They're like baked in. You love him, you hate him, whatever it is, or you just want to ignore it all. Uh, J.D. Vance was able to advance uh, Trump policy ideas in a way that in, in a way and a tone and a voice that was different than what you might have heard before, right? So it was, a, it was America first in a way that said, here's how I got to this position. And it was very genial and very, I think, thoughtful and persuasive. He did not let himself get rattled. He didn't take the bait from the moderators or even from Tim Walls. I do think that in the first minute, it was pretty clear 
that Tim Walls was extremely nervous. And to me, even though he might have recovered a little bit, those first impressions were pretty damning to the point that Joe Klein, who is a Democrat who wrote Primary Colors, basically said it was as he said, it might not have been as bad as Biden's performance, but it was very close to it. At the beginning. That's why the beginning. there were... Well, no, that's Joe Klein's overall impression. Overall. Sorry, overall. If you yeah, read, yeah. he has a substack called Sanity Clause, and I, I pay for it <laughs> ah. because it's worth it. His, he's a great writer. Yeah, he's a great writer. And he's a very independent thinker as from, from the Democratic side. And he's like, that was not good enough. Which a lot of Democrats told me they were holding their breath at the beginning. Yeah, I almost passed out. <laughs> to be frank, Kellyanne had to revive me. She's like, it's not as bad as you think. And I thought, okay, Kellyanne is a generous woman, but she would tell me like it is. I I was incredibly nervous. My text messages will live in infamy from the first 10 to 15 minutes of that. But There were a lot of fundamentals. There were fundamentals, which the new holistic is the running joke on that one. But... Where I think that Walls' recovery came, and again, I hate to be boring about it, I do think the massive takeaway from this is that a civilized politics can exist Mm -hmm. and that the future of the GOP looks a lot more like J.D. Vance than it does like Trump in demeanor and delivery. That doesn't mean the policies are different, but I think that people were heartened who are not necessarily Trump people or don't like the bluster that you could have this. And I saw a lot of people on social media saying, I wish this was the presidential debate that we had, that we were able to have the top of the ticket interacting with each other like this and showing that level of respect and deference for when someone is talking to their experience. And, you know, J.D. Vance has a lot less experience than Tim Walls, which I felt came across. I J.D. needed to tell people who hadn't read Hillbilly Elegy who he is, but he doesn't have a a record. He doesn't have a legislative record to speak of. And that's where I found Walls like getting his footing back because he talked so much about Minnesota and what he's been able to do there, building affordable housing, getting people health care, cutting taxes. There's a reason 3M is here and the health insurance company, what is it, the medical corridor, Mm -hmm. they call it. And I thought that that was defining for him and you could see like when they had their exchanges about the affordable care act that jd vance didn't have a defense for the fact that republicans have been trying to dismantle it with no replacement the concepts of plans is obviously not enough but the intricacies with which tim walls understood the affordable care act can only come if you have been someone that has implemented this that you are responsible for millions Mm. of people being able to get care um, I thought he was also incredibly strong on the abortion issue, talking about it. And J.D. Vance did himself a lot of good. There was a woman in an undecided uh, focus group who loved that he said uh, he broke with the party a little bit and said, we haven't done a good job on this. And he said, we have to be pro-family. You cannot have this go back to the states and not tell people we're going to help you out, whether that means helping you find an adoption service, helping you get the support and care that you need if you are going to have this family. But I thought Walls was really strong. And I know January 6th doesn't rate anymore. But that exchange at the end, which Tim Walls got himself, where he said, Mm -hmm. did did Donald Trump lose the election? And J.D. Vance, because he's so scared of his boss, couldn't say what we all know, which is Joe Biden won this election by many millions of votes. And the ad that went up this morning, I mean, Harris Walls was up by the time I woke up. I'm watching this ad and and it says, if we don't do something, the past will be the future. And J.D. Vance confirmed that, that there would be no problem with that. And the line about Mike Pence would be here if he had Mm -hmm. uh, done what Trump wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Waltz had his, obviously. Oh, the Tiananmen Tiananmen Square thing is so weird. That seems like the easiest prep. You misspoke. You were there eight weeks later. Why is wasn't he prepped? I don't get it. No, because, no, because because the truth is worse. It's all worse than that. Because he lied. Yeah. It's not that he was a knucklehead. Eddie Haskell's a knucklehead from Leave it to Beaver. He lied. And it's not the first time. Uh, the whole stolen valor thing. is it's a, it's a pattern of padding your resume in order to curry favor with people and to make yourself bigger than you are and then your experiences. And people can say, there's another person in this race who exaggerates a lot. Yes, okay, we know who that is. And if you're not okay with that, how can you be okay with this and just like I misspoke, I'm a knucklehead? No, and I don't I don't think it's acceptable. And her 
big Harris's big weakness is with men and I don't think he won back men last night on that at all and certainly not on January 6th panel we'll hold it right there Chad Congressman Waltz obviously has a history up there on Capitol Hill uh, and Governor Waltz has a history in Minnesota um, what's the fallout from all that do people care well, you know, we looked at his voting record when he was here in Congress. He opposed uh, the war in Iraq was something that he was outspoken on when he first came to Congress in early 2007. That's when the war in Iraq was something that was uh, very unpopular. He came in as a moderate Democrat. Uh, this is a seat that he barely hung on to in 2016 by less than one percentage point. And then, you know, when he ran for governor, you know, he definitely has tilted to the left. Uh, you know, he used to be endorsed by the NRA. He's talked about in his debate last night, certainly about his ownership of firearms. Uh, but that's not the same Tim Walls that we saw representing a battleground district uh, in the House of Representatives. The other thing, too, that, you know, we looked into the legislative record, the short legislative record of, of J.D. Vance. Uh, he had only been here about 560 days in the Senate before he was uh, picked by uh, former President Trump to be his running mate. The thing that I think was the great contrast here is that while while Vance didn't have much of a legislative record that people knew, and we talked about this debate being a, a coming out party here, I always look at how the candidates appear on the screen. And J.D. Vance, and this is something that he's honed in the past few years, he's always, you know, looking relaxed. He always has, you know, seems to be prepared, good answers in that sense. Tim Walls was looking down, looking sometimes off the other direction, not understanding how in the language of television you had the double box there. And that just didn't look like he was he was playing as well, maybe not as, as Biden back in late June, but it's the same the same theme. And I think maybe in a, a very lighter cousin of Nixon Kennedy here, where Kennedy looked very relaxed and Nixon looked uh, looked nervous. But that was the thing that Vance stayed away from. You know, he might not have much of a legislative record in the Senate, but, you know, he had done an awful lot of interviews, an awful lot of podcasts. That's where the controversial comments about, uh, you know, uh, you know, single women who own cats comes from and, and things like that. He stayed away from all of that. And if I'm a voter at home just looking through the language of television at the two voters and I see Tim Walls looking rather nervous and I see calm, cool and collected J.D. Vance, you know, they get lost. The viewer sometimes does in the intricacies of the health care policy or what we've done in Minnesota and some of that. And this is where I always talk about the sight bites sometimes outrank mm -hmm the sound bites, and that might have been the case last night. When we didn't have this defining pugilistic moment, you know, you're no Jack Kennedy or something like that, as we often have in these vice presidential debates. I found it interesting that some of the channels were mad that it wasn't more contentious. They were like, <laughs> why, you know, if you're going to agree with him all the time, then, mm -hmm. you know. Then it, we should have picked someone else. Yeah, but... right. Um, but let me ask you this. This does feel, if they don't do another debate, and it doesn't seem like they will, um, and if they don't do, you know, town halls, and it, they may not, they may go into hiding. Uh, they don't do long form interviews. I guess Kamala Harris is going to do 60 minutes. But it seems like we're like in the middle, and Dana loves these sports analogies, <laughs> in the middle of a football field, and we are running back and forth from the 45 to the 45, mm -hmm. you know, week to week, depending on the news cycle, you know, and it's just tilting one way or the other. This is a different race than we've seen. Well, she is doing 60 minutes and Trump pulled out. So they no, say that he never was in, but go what ahead. he said, well, that he was in dependent on not being fact checked, which also upset J.D. Vance that he got fact checked. And I don't think that you can be well, taken an interview seriously. Is different. I mean, an interview yeah. is different than a debate. You set the rules for a debate. That's the debate rules. Right. But, but an who would think you're going to sit down with Scott, Scott Pelley and he's not going to say anything? No one would sit down with you and assume that you didn't know right. the counter example. And they both do have Latino town halls. Uh, hers is in Vegas and his is in Florida, mm -hmm. uh, which I do think says something about how they're feeling about Florida. I get it. He likes to be close to home. But you would think he would be going to something somewhere more of a battleground state. My understanding from people in Kamala's orbit about the media strategy, and this is for her and for Walls, is that it will ramp up. That it was clear also last night that Walls should have been doing as many reps as J.D. Vance on the Sunday shows because he used to be the best interviewer. We in had the game. him on a lot, didn't right. we? We had him on America's Newsroom. Yeah. We had him on special. And reports. he was he was nervous, but he was also rusty. So he has, I think he's in three or four states over the next three or four days. He's doing tons of interviews. They're going to be doing more non-traditional media as well. But one component 
that I know they're frustrated about that people are not paying attention to is how much local press they're doing. They've been doing that in Wisconsin. They've been doing that in Pennsylvania. And they feel that it is something that is reaching this very small sliver of undecided swing voters. We'll see. I mean, I guess I haven't been following or it hasn't really made a lot of news in those local interviews. Well, one of the things people say they want is change. And I think Tim Walls in the debate looked like a creature of Washington, older, all the talking points the same. And it was not refreshing, right? And so if you're it's hard looking to believe like he's 60. Yeah. yeah, he looked older. He reads older than that. And Trump reads a lot younger than he is. I think Kamala Harris reads a little younger than she is, but she, like, yeah. she looks great. Sure. Um, and J.D. Vance looks young, uh, but he sounds wiser and older. So um, I think they're playing a little prevent defense on both sides. Yeah. So playing not to lose rather than like the Trump team playing to win. And in order to play to win, you got to take some risks. They have been doing that. But now I think everyone, I'm afraid they're all going to just go to their corners and then whoever wins, don't be surprised about what their policies are because you, you wouldn't have had any way to know. Right. We just ha- don't have enough time. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem it's like it. Truncated uh, campaign. For Chad, them. final word here. The uh, Nothing's going to happen in Congress before the election. Right. Probably not. Uh, We talked earlier about FEMA uh, and about uh, there was a lot of chatter on Capitol Hill about whether or not they would have to recall the Congress to re-up the funds for something called the DRF, D-R-F, the Disaster Relief Fund to address what's going on in North Carolina. Uh, I don't think that that's practicable. And here's why. They have about $20 billion in that fund. And even though we've had almost a Katrina-like storm that's hit the the, the parts of Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, there's no way that in the next 30 days that FEMA can, you know, drain all that money. So that money, that's the disaster relief fund that goes to these immediate needs, housing, medicine, food, shelter, et cetera, that is taken care of. Uh, So I don't think that's going to be the case. It was interesting that you had this bipartisan coalition of Democratic and Republican senators who uh, wrote to Schumer, the majority leader, uh, Chuck Schumer, yesterday saying, you know, we ask, and these were, you know, people like, uh, you know, Tim Kaine uh, from Virginia and certainly the North Carolina delegation saying, you know, recall the Congress here. Uh, That's probably not going to happen. That's them just trying to be on good political footing and say, we're doing as much as we can for our uh, constituents and and putting pressure on Washington, D.C. But but passing another bill and what that looks like down the road, you know, they have to fund the government by December 20th. I mentioned Israel and I mentioned the possibility of Ukraine. Mike Johnson, the speaker, says he's not going to do an omnibus or a a glom together bill here. I just don't know how that how that looks. And the one thing I would leave, leave everybody with, and this is something I've looked at very closely here. We've had this mass disaster in North Carolina. Western North Carolina is practically impassable in certain areas. That is a swing state. Uh, The Republicans are supposed to, because of redistricting, that delegation in the House right now is 7-7. It probably goes 10-4 due to redistricting in favor of the Republicans. But when you have a natural disaster about five to six weeks before an election, does that affect who gets to the polls, where the polls are, uh, whether or not this is on people's radar when they don't have enough to eat or they don't have a house or a job anymore. Uh, those are serious concerns. And sometimes that impacts an election. And that is something to look at with those political uh, uh, concerns heading into North Carolina ahead of November. Yeah. And all the ballots going out to mailboxes that may not be there. You got it. Uh, you got it's it. a big mm-hmm. deal. Thank you all. A lot of fun. Now for a bit of history. On October 7th, 1967, Thurgood Marshall was sworn in, becoming the first African-American justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. As the chief counsel of the NAACP, Thurgood Marshall argued more than a dozen cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, winning many notable cases that successfully challenged racial segregation. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson nominated Marshall to fill the seat of retiring Justice Tom Clark. Though this sparked debate, the Senate ultimately confirmed Marshall's nomination by a vote of 69 to 11, landing him in the history books when he was sworn into the nation's highest court 57 years ago today. That'll do it for this week. You can hear more of this series at foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you download podcasts. Make sure to leave a rating and a review. We want to hear from you. For Jessica, Dana, and Chad, I'm Brett Baer. We'll see you next time. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts and Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.